My name is Monica Goracci. I am the director of the Department of Migration Management in um, headquarters here in IOM. So yesterday, the conversation focused more on the broader impact of COVID on mobility. We heard from governments, from agencies, from the EU, from mayors about migration triggers, uh, the future of border management, government responses, and the need to integrate responses and to work together. We heard about some very interesting initiatives. And today it's the time really to give the voice to the migrants as actors of the responses. We've heard it already yesterday on you know, the extent to which migrants have been impacted by the pandemic, loss of jobs, restrained access to services, including vaccination the widened gap between people who can move and people who cannot, and thus exacerbating inequalities. And yet, during the pandemic, migrants were the so-called essential workers, keeping the food production, healthcare sectors afloat. We've seen many examples of countries flying in migrants for the harvest seasons. For example, in Germany, in Belgium, Italy, the UK, and, and the US, roughly one in five essential workers is a migrant woman or migrant man. And as we look at uh, opportunities and look ahead to build forward better by promoting a more sustainable and, and climate and migrant inclusive society and economy, we have the possibility to do that. As I think yesterday, Jessica Bitter from the Robert Bosch uh, Stiftung said, you know, are we going to go back to the normal or are we building forward? Are we doing something different? And we have the opportunity to, to work on an inclusive society, on, on a climate resilient society, and to work on an economy that leaves no migrant behind. And we cannot but do this together. DDG Daniels concluded the panel yesterday saying migrants must be part of the solution in recovering from COVID-19 and accelerating progress towards the 2030 agenda. And we believe we are really at a crossroads here in our global sustainable development landscape. We can leverage the opportunities provided by migrants, empowering them as equal partners and development actors, or we risk leaving migrants behind, widening inequalities and cutting off any chance of achieving the 2030 agenda. And I think that in, in the IDM's 20 years of existence, I, don't, I can't recall a moment where the opportunity of migration to benefit all has been clearer and where the need for migrant inclusive approach to sustainable development has been stronger. And this is why I'm so pleased to have uh, our, our three panelists here today and to, to have this conversation with them to share their experience. Each panelist you would see is a real change maker. So I really look forward to the discussion. And I would like to start with uh, someone who is online with us. It's uh, Caroline Caporossi, who is a 27 year old Italian American social entrepreneur and founder of the Association for the Integration of Women, AIW, a nonprofit organization dedicated to migrant women's integration in Modena in Italy. Caroline grew up in a third generation Italian immigrant household in the United States. In 2016, she relocated to Modena, Italy, where she served as the program development officer at Food for Soul, the international nonprofit founded by the famous chef Massimo Bottura. In April 2020, after having witnessed the extreme need for economic integration services for migrant women in her community, Caroline founded the AIW and currently is dedicated to launching a unique food-based integration model as a long-term solution, which was awarded the Youth Innovation and Leadership Award in January 2021 at the Global Forum on Migration and Development by the United Nations Major, major Group for Children and Youth Migration. What an experience for such a young person. So Caroline, I have two questions for you. I will uh, ask them both uh, together so that because they're, they're interlinked. So the first one is on employment. Can you speak about your direct experience working with migrant women throughout the pandemic and how, tell us a little bit how the demand has changed from employers and what are some of the gaps and challenges that you've seen? And, and second, 
is really focused on youth. Young people make up the largest percentage of global migrants and can be a really a key stakeholder to recovery. We'll have a panel afterwards dedicated to youth, but if you can just introduce us to this topic, how can young migrants and migrant workers be supported in becoming more resilient in a post-COVID economy? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know where to look because I see you there on the screen, but I know that I have to look there in order for you to, so I'm sorry for this. Anyway, Caroline? You have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor to be addressing all of you today. Good afternoon, good morning. Um, um, I'm, I'm really pleased to be sharing my experience as the founder of a social enterprise, but also as, as a young activist working in my community um, with public and private partnerships, um, and as a representative of the, my, of the uh, Migrant Youth and Children Platform, a constituency of the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth. So quickly, um, my organization is called the Association for the Integration of Women, and we are dedicated to creating a platform for young women living in Modena who have potential and connecting them with opportunity through non-traditional education models, so technical and non-technical skill training. Um, and the Migration Youth and Children platform, our, our work there is to create the future that youth want to see by engaging them in migration issues and activism. We do this through a mandate um, to, um, consider youth and to facilitate youth participation and engagement at the Global Forum for Migration and Development. Um, we bring youth inputs and priorities to the Global Compact for Migration Reviews, and we also facilitate partnership um, creation and capacity building for a large network of young activists all over the world. Um, so to address your questions, um, the first um, about my direct experience working with migrant women and how we were noticing changes in the labor demands. Um, I think that the, the important takeaway is that we've seen that there's a huge opportunity for nonprofits and specifically for social enterprises that kind of bridge this gap between for-profit and nonprofit to be a key partner in, um, for society for skilling in terms of addressing labor market gaps and thus also for building more resilient um, systems and societies. So, this kind of started for us pre-pandemic. We found it in April of 2020, but AIW was in development a little bit before. So before um, the COVID pandemic, we created this nonprofit to be unique and to really play that role as a bridge between the public and private sector. On one hand, identifying gaps in the labor market, and on the other, gaining access to our beneficiaries who would be young migrant women seeking employment. Um, in Modena, which, um, as Ms. Garachi says, is world famous for food, thanks to the contribution of Chef Massimo Batura, um, and for many of our food and cultural heritages we have in Modena, like Parmesan cheese and balsamic vinegar and much more, um, we identified specifically a labor market gap in the restaurant sector. So we identified that restaurants were often looking for kind of medium level, entry level employees that they weren't able to find. And so we, we thought that um, through food and through cooking, not only could we create job opportunities for women who often have a lot of experience in the sector naturally, and maybe even some strong passion, but also through food, it would be a great way to break down stereotypes, to fight xenophobia, and to create a more inclusive future um, here in Modena. So of course, um, like most other enterprises and nonprofits, our work was turned upside down by the pandemic. Um, we pivoted knowing that a lot of women living in Modena had seamstress skills. And so instead we asked our partners at social services to refer us women who were one seamstresses and thus we were able to employ 800 hours of work last year sewing face masks. So filling another gap. Um, finally, this year in May, we were able to launch our culinary training program, and so that is a 300 hour paid job training program teaching technical and non technical skills to women who are hoping for futures as cooks. And this is also coming at a time where there's a global restaurant worker shortage. So by the end of our program, we actually had more requests for uh, employees coming directly from the restaurant sector than we had trainees. And 100% of the women who were referred by us had job offers before graduating the program. 
Um, so I think that, yes, as I said, the takeaway is that there's a huge opportunity for nonprofits and also I think a specific, a very interesting opportunity globally for the role of social enterprises. Um, these nonprofits um, or these social impact organizations that um, can bridge that gap and can really be key stakeholders in a post pandemic resilient economy. Um, and a few of the, um, the challenges that I'd like to also present are also because, of course, um, the COVID pandemic has created some intersecting pressures that the women we work with um, are experiencing, which also could be opportunities for the future. Um, so just um, to name just three of these, one of them is definitely a consideration for family obligations. Um, here in Modena in 2018, 40% of children born were actually born of migrant parents. Um, and 75% of families who requested food assistance during the pandemic were migrant families. Um, it's absolutely essential if we, um, if our goal is to employ women and to give them a real chance at economic integration to invest in the care economy, which uh, not only is a, is a key function in supporting women to be able to have equitable participation um, as employees, but also it's a great opportunity for uh, training and for jobs for many other women as well. So we're gonna be looking at that here in Modena next year. Um, another of the main gaps is that we've, we've seen um, a, sometimes a hesitancy for migrants and the women we work with to disclose certain real challenges that they're facing that could preclude them for jobs for fear of losing an opportunity that they've worked so hard for. So here we think that the role of cultural mediators could not be more important. Um, we know that IOM has, um, is engaging the labor ministry here in Italy, which is cited as a best practice for ethical recruitment. Um, and we've been asked at a local level by restaurants to continue to play the role as a cultural mediator, not only at the time of job referral, but ongoing um, as this work placement as well. So we think that cultural mediators, not as this kind of external consultancy, but as a, as a key um, a key element for these partnerships to work long term. And then the third um, that I'd like to bring up is uh, literacy levels, um, both reading and writing, but also technological. Um, we noticed that, so typically some of the jobs that we're talking about, you would not have had to have very high literacy levels necessarily, so that wouldn't have excluded you. But COVID, COVID has changed that. Um, so we're finding that uh, whether it's online um, security job, whether it's the ability to get to work, or whether it's, it's simply um, having to engage and navigate some of these processes related to health um, that are completely now required in order to be an active employee in Italy and in a lot of countries. Um, so it's absolutely essential that we um, support women and everyone with a uh, education for girls, access to education, but also uh, technological um, literacy as well. Should I go on to the second question? Yes, please. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so um, then you asked me about uh, young people and our role and uh, how we can be players and uh, I guess how, how we can be supported to be more effective players in post pandemic. So we absolutely um, agree young people are the most mobile social group, um, a huge opportunity for achieving the 2030 agenda and um, absolutely essential for building back post COVID recovery. Um, and I think that not only um, not only taking this into consideration, but also inviting young people like today to, to, be, um, to be engaged and to be included at policymaking discussions is a generally a best practice and is something that the major group for children and youth is doing so well and making accessible. Um, a few things that the major group for children and youth um, want to bring up today in terms of how young people can be supported to be more, um, to be more effective in being part of a post-pandemic economy. Um, one is the need to create framework for skills and qualifications. So this is especially relevant for highly skilled migrant workers with foreign university uh, titles that aren't always recognized. Um, so we need to be able to create um, quicker and more efficient ways to recognize those qualifications and to make them be able to be key, um, key players in our society. Another um, access to education needs to be lifelong access. Um, right now, there are, there are some policies that make um, access to education for irregular migrants 
um, limited on a certain amount of time. And that not only is not always realistic, but it also can be discriminatory, especially for women who on average migrant women uh, tend to access uh, education and, and, and into an economic integration, excuse me, later in life after maybe kids are raised and out of the home. Third is financial support. So we definitely advocate for uh, policies um, and partnerships, whether with, its, with nonprofits and foundations that um, provide access to funds for young people and to paid work. Um, one of the things um, for AIW, it's also a priority that all of our job training programs are 100% paid. Um, this doesn't only give uh, women and individuals a, a degree of independence that's very important, but it also allows them to take part more in our society and thus to have more social integration as well. And then the fourth um, would be protection. So in order for young people and migrant workers to become more resilient in the post COVID economy, we need to ensure uh, their legal labor and financial protect protection during uncertain times. This includes job security, access to emergency, financial support and housing um, that were strongly felt during the COVID pandemic. Um, so thank you so much. I think that sums up um, my intervention. I'll pass it back over to you, Ms. Garachi. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Caroline, for, for uh, your, uh, your, your presentation and the points you're leaving us with. I think you know, it, it's very interesting to see how, how one can really, if, if we quickly adapt uh, to a situation, how, no matter how challenging it, it is, if you have an open mind and if you work together in an integrated manner, you can identify solutions that really uh, help changing the, the the mindset. And this, for women as well as for young people, you mentioned very important things and recognition of qualifications and lifelong education and uh, protection and inclusion. Ultimately, the young people are the agiles of tomorrow and they need to be uh, a part of the discussion now and, and identification of solutions. And I think Modena is, uh, is, um, is an interesting experience. I think we had in IOM the first, uh, one of the first migration for development initiatives where we actually looked at uh, the, the remittances from the angle of savings, like migrants, who have invested their savings in ananas plantations in Ghana and uh, linking this with the um, uh, with with the uh, with the local municipality and with uh, the distribution of ananas in Modena so you know we also started with uh, food in Modena many years ago on um, on work with uh, migration and development and the diaspora so now we pass to our next speaker, Amina Hirsi, who is here with us. Amina is the founder of the Atiak Sugar Project and is a leading African entrepreneur, an investor, and one of the most successful businesswomen in East Africa. She's been a champion of empowering women through business and has been named Women Investor of the Year, Most Influential Women, woman, Best Woman Entrepreneur and African Business Woman of the Year, among other accolades. Amina began her business career at an early age, helping her parents with cross-border trade across the Kenya-Uganda border. Today, her business employs 4,000 people. And I understand, Amina, you were considering retiring in 2012 when you were approached by a group of women from northern Uganda and learned more about the struggles of women in the region. Livelihoods had been decimated by the war and it was clear the people needed help. And so you leveraged her other businesses to fund and build the Atiak Sugar Factory in the north and you pioneered a new sugarcane industry as a vehicle for development in the region. So Amina's migrant background comes from her children working in family and cross-border trade and her work as a migrant and with migrants has continued since. We're very lucky to have you here with us, Amina, and I'm very excited to hear about your experience as an employer from the private sector perspectives. And my questions for you is first, as an employer with COVID-19 and the related mobility restrictions and, and border closures, what challenges did you have related to hiring employees and, and how did you overcome these? And secondly, what do you need is needed in terms of skills, especially in rural areas? 
And what advice would you have for governments, for the private sector and the international community on matching education with labor demand? Thank you. Thank you Thank you very much. I am very, very humbled and, uh, and privileged to be here today, to be invited by IOM to come and uh, speak about ATIAC. I also thank my other uh, fellow speakers who are the ones who have spoke and the ones who are going to speak. Uh, I know Traveling this time is very, very difficult, but I'm, help, I'm happy I had to take this opportunity because it is a very, very important for a, and a country, Uganda, and actually Africa itself, for me to be here to talk about our challenges and our also solution. I want to take this opportunity first to talk about the first questions which have been given the problem I faced through the pandemic and employment. I would like to say is that, uh, first of all, Africa has a problem of unemployment. It's about 70% of our youth who are almost 30 years are not having jobs. But again, with this uh, pandemic, it has even became more because uh, most of them were moving from uh, the rural areas to, to the city or urban to, to work there. So the issue which I want to say is that uh, for me, I came in into a job creation and my rural development group of women came and approached me and told me that uh, we have land and we need to, for you to come and help us how we can transform our area. And it, so when I went to Atiak, I found the, the place is very good, fertile, and it is able to be uh, developed, but it just needed courageous people to see, and actually closer to Southern Sudan. So uh, pro proximity, rainfall, everything was very good. So what I did, I, I took that opportunity to go and build the, the, a factory, which is uh, actually from a start. So I managed to bring all the vulnerable women together we started uh, the place with my little finance, which I had, but I got a lot of issues that the factory needed a lot of things because of the bush clearance, so many things which I encountered. Then I had to bring other partners, which is the government of Uganda, which has partnered with me. But uh, when we came now, the time of building, I had to import a lot of people from foreign countries because that kind of uh, people who are able to, to, to take that job skills, we didn't have it. And again, the people who are supplying me machineries and all that, they said they want specific people to do direction, the specific people who will follow their, their who will follow the, the way they have uh, designed even the construction, they said they have to do it. So which I agreed because I wanted the factory to be done. So I brought more than 500 people who are doing all that job. But uh, when the pandemic happened and everywhere was closed, it was very, very difficult to bring now more people either from out, even within our country, because everywhere was closed whereby even the ones who are in the city could not come to other places. So we were in the middle of actually commissioning and all of a sudden things were closed. So I had to come in and uh, look for other solutions because for me, I wanted to see that the factory 
works. So what I did is that uh, I talked to my suppliers and all that to come up with other solutions, which they brought us online support. And this online support, what they did is that uh, we had to have the people who are there to be trying to see with their support from out how we can do it. So I realize it is, if we want to do those kind of projects and that in rural areas and that, we need to think bigger to see that we even empower the people who are actually closer to us to start thinking of how they can be empowered so that they don't look at, they have to look at other new pastures to go and move so that they don't move. But actually, I also think about them that they could not have done that because the rural area was not employing anybody. It was not giving anybody any chance because there was no nothing there before. So I think, and uh, with me put in the factory, we need also to see how with all these challenges, we should not go back to that. It's not only my place, I think, it should work in many other places that once people are empowered from within, even they can go and work elsewhere, but when there is problem, they can still come home. The, this is their home and they can take the opportunity. Now, uh, my biggest problem even with that is that people do not want even to stay in a place like that because they are not used to. They have already settled in other places but because of now where they are also, they are finding very, very difficult to get jobs. So for mine, what I say is that uh, we are able to give uh, the solution on this issue whereby creating, creating good uh, in, uh, workforce, but with right, right, uh, which they should have the, the, the right uh, in, uh, in skills. Uh, we have uh, in, uh, a number of, uh, in a number of vulnerable women, people who are displaced and they're in a very, very state, but they are willing to learn. They are willing, so I, I think what I want is that uh, the pandemic has really shown us that even the country and everywhere that we need to build our own capacity. And the capacity should start from where you are. And this is what I would like to say on the first, uh, first uh, in question. So the second question of solution. Solution, I would like uh, to have uh, other partners with, so that we don't make people to migrate from the rural area or migrate from, uh, for us to spend so much money to export people from out, we should see how we can and build our capacity by bringing a, a, a way whereby we have uh, in institutions where people are being trained, things even which are being trained, it's not really, really, it's technology. It's people who are hand, hands on, like the welders, like the, the, the fitters, but they need to have very, very good skills to do that. You can be just a welder, but you are not a welder who can do the factory. You will be a fitter, but we need you exactly that you have been given the skills that you can see when something gets spoiled, you can do it the right way. Otherwise, that's why we also spend a lot of money to bring people from out. Another thing I would like other partners, and I'm actually now partnering with IOM and uh, who can give us beyond even like uh, the automation to give more skills to see, uh, more production make uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a different way. So I think another thing I want to say is that this is a new place which we have started. People even can start up a lot of inform innovations there because now there was no settlement, but now we have settlement. When settlement comes, people now are willing to do many, many things. Maybe they will need now shops, 
they will uh, need uh, people who are able to build for them even our houses they like the farmers who are getting uh, money now from the cane they have sold now they have the money in uh, in their in uh, capacity don't know they have the money to spend because now they have sold their their cane which to the factory so they might want to build a house they might want to build a school so we, i will really think if we can have a total solution of re-transforming the rural area with the way I'm doing, we will have like another city there than some people migrating from one place to the other. The other place, another thing I want to say, Southern Sudan is very close to me more than even going to Kampala. Juba is 200 kilometers to my factory but I am 430 kilometers to Kampala. So it can also create and help people who are really migrating from another country. We are just almost like in the same place. And this also is another way of uh, giving total, to, total and uh, you know, when people have and peace, total peace also comes with economics. So people, when they are having money, they have jobs, they can take children to school. This is the only way they can uh, have. So I'm really empowering people. I have more than 4,000. I've just started with no, there was no road. There was no nothing. And I came with all this. And I'm happy that uh, we are already producing sugar. We have even exported sugar beyond. I want to take this opportunity also to thank the president of Uganda because he is a revolutionary, he wants transformation and he has gone even the areas which was very difficult to see transformation is being done. Him and his government, I'm very, very happy that he has also helped a, a woman who is an immigrant because I came from Kenya to, to Uganda, to Uganda, so I think this is also giving uh, diaspora and everybody that we are able to use that like the, the way the women came to me and I took that risk and I'm happy this, is, this has happened. Thank you very much, Amina, and I'm happy too. And I'm very happy that you didn't retire and that, you, <laughs> that you. you're sharing with us this experience. Yes. It's, you know, we, in IOM, we have this uh, project thinking and this solution uh, ahead. So I was already thinking about so many places where this could be replicated. And, um, and, and you raise the importance of the local level and the capacity development at local level, the responsibility of the local level, the rural areas. And I have lots of questions for you also on how to uh, promote the interest and trigger the interest of people to come back and to invest in, but there is no time, unfortunately, but I'm sure we'll keep in touch. And, yes. uh, and I'm sure all my colleagues who are online will want to get in touch with you <laughs> to know <laughs> how, to, how to promote uh, this approach. So thank you very much for thank sharing you. this with us. I'm moving now to our next speaker, Peter Kvok, who is also online with us. Peter is also experienced on this very topic. He's the founder and chair of the UK Federation of Chinese Professionals, a national community organization that aims to support, develop, and promote global Chinese pro professionals in the country. The Federation brings together four regional associations to work with Chinese professionals to pioneer charitable initiatives for their communities and the society. And Peter previously advised on the development of Scotland's China plan and is a member of the National Independent Strategic Advisory Group of uh, Police Scotland. He also advocates for Chinese diasporas in a number of nationwide advisory groups in the areas of East and Southeast Asian community, community safety, business and language learning. And Peter is also the chair of the Global Diaspora Confederation. He received the freedom of the city of Glasgow and was nominated finalists for UK's charity chair of the year in 2020. As a diaspora member working to support diaspora, Peter exemplifies the ways migrants and diaspora make a communities more vibrant 
inclusive and successful. So Peter, I have two questions also for you. First, I'd be interested in hearing about your work supporting diaspora members. How have you been working to empower and to support the diaspora to feel included and access decent work? What barriers do you face, including in relation to COVID-19? And what remains to be done at policy level to help further this work? And then the second question is, what kind of partnerships have you sought to achieve this work? Like with universities or local authorities or private sector, and how has this helped you achieve your goals? So Peter, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ms. Karachi. As uh, Ms. Hoggy said, this is a new way we have started and find uh, innovation and innovative solutions, and especially harnessing the technology. And thank you very much for having me virtually alongside such wonderful speakers. And if I may, I would uh, try to answer both questions together and first describe the barriers that we have been trying very hard to overcome. So in order to empower and support our diaspora members, we first had to identify what they needed the most. According to the Chartered Institute for Personal Development, CIPD's survey in 2020, um, almost half, 49% of UK workers are in jobs. They are either under or overskilled. It may seem fine for UK education uh, enables workers to work in jobs that are not related to their degree subjects, but they can use their transferable skills to pick up a job from scratch. However, during the pandemic, the labor market does not only look at the long term, but also the short term. There is less time for one job training while required skills become more specific. All these create a job mismatch and yes, it may not affect the over-skilled professionals too much, but it is impacting the larger population of professionals who are skillful, but not having the specific skills required. The issue of job mismatch can be more severe in diaspora communities, such as our Chinese professional community. According to our own Chinese, uh, Young Chinese Professionals Research in 2019, many members of our community mentioned that they were working in roles that have nothing to do with their university education. But the Chinese diaspora tend to have their own challenges, such as lack of time to apply for job due to expiring visas, difficulty in settling into a, a completely new living and work environment, language barriers, lack of mental support, etc. In addition, we also know it is not uncommon for diaspora to experience glass ceiling during their career even for a country that is so conscious of this, like the United Kingdom. All these have given rise to mental feelings on diaspora members who may not even have friends or families to talk to. And worse, when pandemic began, people were desperate to find something to name it. And China became an, a choice that is in a way enabled those who took advantage of ordinary Chinese diaspora members across the world. Although I would never compare the number of perpetrators with the number of pandemic cases, it was severe enough to create community tension amongst East and Southeast Asian communities who they felt were from the same place of origin. Unfortunately, the tsunami of xenophobia as the UN Secretary General described, does not only happen in one race in one country at a certain period of time. And this is why UKFCP stepped in. We empower and support our diaspora members to feel included and access uh, decent work by strengthening the trust, resilience, 
and self-help of our community. By harnessing the technology, last February, I uh, set up the uh, UK's first national virtual support center for East and Southeast Asian communities. Listening to the challenges during the pandemic and when necessary, work closely with supportive organizations such as the Police Scotland and the Metropolitan Police to address the challenges. Many have felt there is a, an increasing distrust in the public sector. While there is also a communication gap we all want to close. And by boosting and uh, encouraging mutual understanding, we have successfully built trust between communities and the public sector that enabled more of our diaspora members feel, to feel included and more reassured. And having said that, uh, we know this is an ongoing journey still. And during the pandemic lockdowns, accessing decent work has been particularly challenging for our young diaspora members. Many of them cannot travel back to the UK and vice versa to meet with employers that many jobs were deferred or lost because of this problem. Later this year, we will be organizing our first UK-China career sphere that enables more virtual career dialogues without the concern of travel restrictions and lack of access to employers who are actually looking for them. So we noticed it is not often the skills or our diaspora members lack, but the adaptability in a completely new environment. One of the very effective ways to learn that adaptability is to volunteer. Our support center, our career fair, our training programs and partnership building are all handled by diaspora volunteers who come from over 22 countries from 19, 19 to 76 years old, from university students to chief levels of multinational corporations. They create the, um, the inclusivity and they also expand their professional networks and they share job opportunities. Some of them actually help each other to find jobs and, and be in the job the other volunteer previously was in. What a coincidence and wonderful examples and help others settle in to their workplace while using their professional and multicultural skills to develop projects that support more diaspora members in need. So we, we also see a large number of volunteers have received a job offer within three months uh, of volunteering to, although they, they came to us volunteering not to, uh, uh, to find a job, but uh, I think uh, actually volunteering helped a lot, especially during this time. So I once I heard, um, I once heard if you give a person a fish, they will be hungry tomorrow. If you teach a person to fish, they will be richer forever. And this is exactly what we do at uh, the UK Federation of Chinese Professionals, UKFCP. Enriching our diaspora members with opportunities to develop themselves personally and professionally. You know, I think this is exactly what Amina and uh, Caroline have been succeeding in too. For example, in terms of partnerships, uh, before the community tension began, I introduced the, uh, the concept of the, the virtual third party reporting center to the police Scotland in response to the difficulty in traveling to uh, uh, report physically of the hate instance of crime even. Um, we also offered our support to and shared our challenges of seldom heard communities with the Scottish Government, Deputy Mayor of London and local councils last year. We partnered with the University of Strathclyde in Scotland to offer academic placements for diaspora students to look into the well-being of our diaspora professionals while they themselves learn more about the work environment in the UK and develop new skills through our student ambassador program 
that is joined by students from uh, seven universities in the UK. So we also strengthened our community uh, and communication with our other diaspora associations, not only Chinese related, so that together we can better support diaspora communities affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Last year, we have also published our joint statement in solidarity with those affected by uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and they have been experienced xenophobia, hate, discrimination, and prejudice. And um, the joint statement was signed by over 230 diaspora organizations from 150 countries across the world. And I have to have your thanks again to IOM for all your very kind support uh, on this. And of course, later on, we're able to uh, establish the Global Diaspora Confederation, which is thriving, having the, the fourth both meeting later this afternoon as well. Um, in terms of the migration policy, I, uh, I also feel fortunate that the UK work visa now en enables international graduates to stay in the UK for two years. They, are, they now have more time to look for work and potentially help tackle the current huge uh, staff shortage in the country. And in face of Scotland's aging population, Scotland also seeks to uh, attract more migrants to grow the economy and population. These are all very good policies. And my advice, or perhaps only advice today, is uh, how we can ensure these policies continue to reflect the positive impact of diaspora members in order to achieve more successes in the society in the long run. So thank you very much for having me. And um, yeah, pleasure to be here. Thank you, Peter, for this uh, statement and also for complimenting and well and highlighting also uh, some issues that uh, both Amina and and, um, and Caroline uh, raised, and also to to highlight how the technology um, is is a very useful tool in overcoming distance and promoting integration. I think we all saw the value of technology during the pandemic as a tool that brought us together, even if nothing can replace face to face. And it's so nice to see so many of you in the room physically. But in the absence of it, it is a really important tool that has helped uh, people a lot to stay connected. I think I have now two statements um, lined up. Uh, the first is from um, uh, Mariam al Kari from Qatar. If you're online. Yes. Hello, you can hear me well? Yes. We can. Yes, okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this event. Uh, I would like to give you a brief about the efforts made by migrant workers uh, in Qatar to uh, guarantee resilient and sustainable post pandemic recovery aligned with the sustainable development uh, goals. Uh, Qatar set up urgent and well coordinated uh, policies to address uh, the negative effects of the uh, cr crisis on uh, migrant worker, uh, workers by adopting a set of measures providing uh, comprehensive uh, protection for, uh, for all workers and guarantee the sustainability of businesses and uh, jobs. Uh, migrant workers uh, played a key role in uh, controlling COVID-19 uh, through their uh, commitment and cooperation to combat uh, the pandemic. Uh, they have uh, strongly contributed uh, to the awareness raising campaigns uh, organized by the government in cooperation with workers, uh, represent representatives and uh, labor attached. The establishment of uh, joint committees, including uh, elected workers, uh, representatives, uh, strengthened uh, social dialogue with migrant workers and help uh, them to participate in the efforts made by all society to face uh, the crisis uh, challenges. Uh, frontline employees, uh, especially female workers, made a lot of uh, efforts uh, during the crisis to provide uh, health care and vaccination to all uh, society. 
Female health, uh, health care uh, workers uh, show devotion to combat the spread of the virus and uh, large, uh, largely uh, contributed to the success of national, uh, national vaccination campaign. Uh, due to uh, these efforts, uh, Qat uh, Qatar has recorded one of the lowest COVID-19 uh, mortality uh, uh, rates uh, in the world. Uh, there is also a high turnout of vaccination as more uh, than 82.6% uh, of the total population uh, is now fully vaccinated uh, with two doses. Uh, in conclusion, I would like to thank uh, the International Dialogue on Migration uh, for this uh, opportunity and uh, assure Qatar commitment to continue supporting, uh, supporting migrant workers and implementing uh, sustainable uh, development goals. Uh, thank you all for your uh, attention. Thank you, Mariam, for this uh, contribution from Qatar. And I now uh, give the floor to Baki Bila from Bangladesh. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, I think uh, you can hear me. Yeah. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. I thank the distinguished panelists for their thoughtful deliberations. The studies of the successful initiative for mobilizing migrants' potentials are exemplary. Migrants are an enabler of sustainable development goals and the engine of development in many countries. Despite comprising only about 3.5% of the global population, migrants contribute about 10% of global GDP. Their contribution is, ex is explicitly tangible in the socioeconomic phenomenon in countries of origin and destination. Remittances are lifeline for many families in developing countries. It has been a driver of poverty reduction and improvement in access to healthcare. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed the fragility of our societies. With the economic fallout, many families have receded to poverty in developing countries. It has held back developing countries' grand achievement in attaining SDGs. Tackling this daunting challenge requires collective efforts globally. Migrants must be part of the solution and their potential need to be utilized to build back better and sustainable. To this end, we suggest the following. First, all migrants, irrespective of their migratory status, must be included in the COVID-19 recovery plans and programs at national and international levels. Second, the holistic and development-oriented migration governance that the ZCM has introduced needs to be reinforced to implement SDG 10.7. Third, a 360-degree approach as a stability in the ZCM needs to be made esteemed in all migrants and migration related actions at the national, regional and global levels. Fourth, migrants must not be excluded from decent and productive jobs in the post pandemic time. Finally, countries of origin, particularly developing countries must be appropriately supported for the sustainable reintegration of returning migrants into their economies. I thank you. Thank you um, very much, Mr. Billa, for, for this contribution. I think we have uh, Algeria on the line who wants to take the floor. Before then, I try to wrap up and give the floor for one last question to the, our panelists. Please, you have the floor. Merci, Madame la Modératrice. Bonjour, chers collègues, excellences, mesdames et messieurs. Comme c'est la première fois que je prends la parole au titre de cette session, je tiens à remercier l'OIM pour le maintien de sa tradition d'un dialogue annuel sur les questions d'actualité qui représente un grand intérêt pour les États membres, les migrants eux-mêmes et la communauté internationale dans son ensemble. Je tiens également à remercier les panélistes pour leur précieuse contribution à ces débats ce matin. L'Algérie, qui dispose d'une importante communauté établie à l'étranger, accorde un intérêt particulier à sa participation active dans tous les secteurs du développement national. C'est dans cet esprit qu'intervient la récente décision des hautes autorités algériennes de modifier l'appellation officielle du ministère des Affaires étrangères en y ajoutant l'élément de la communauté nationale à l'étranger. Il ne s'agit pas d'un simple changement dans la forme, mais plutôt d'une orientation stratégique en soi, étant donné que la communauté nationale établie à l'étranger demeure une partie intégrante de la mère patrie. En effet, mon pays est convaincu de la nécessité d'accompagner les enfants de sa diaspora à l'étranger qui jouissent d'importantes potentialités 
et compétences susceptibles de donner un nouveau souffle à la société et renforcer leur contribution aux divers projets de développement politico-économique de notre pays. Il est tout aussi convaincu de l'importance de faire de ses ressortissants, à titre individuel et collectif, des ambassadeurs de l'Algérie, défenseurs de son image et de ses intérêts, eux qui jouissent de tous les droits et devoirs de la citoyenneté. C'est pourquoi le plan d'action du gouvernement prévoit l'application d'une stratégie novatrice visant à impliquer concrètement la communauté algérienne établie à l'étranger dans le développement du pays. Cette stratégie s'inscrit dans une vision globale et à long terme, destinée à renforcer la place et le rôle de nos compatriotes installés à l'étranger en tant que composante indissociable de la nation. Des mesures concrètes et opérationnelles sont prévues dans cette stratégie, telles que l'incitation de nos compatriotes à investir dans des projets économiques, leur implication dans la stratégie de promotion des exportations hors hydrocarbures, leur encouragement à drainer leurs épargnes par l'ouverture de banques et de succursales et l'encadrement des milliers de commerçants et hommes d'affaires expatriés. Dans le même sillage, l'Algérie est en train de finaliser le projet du portail web dédié aux compétences nationales étrangères afin d'en faire un véritable creuset, une interface entre l'offre et la demande pouvant émaner des ministères, des universités, des organismes des entreprises, des hôpitaux, des centres de recherche dans de nombreux domaines, domaines tels que la santé, l'éducation, la formation, l'énergie, la gestion et l'intelligence artificielle. Ainsi, afin de consolider les passerelles liant les ressortissants à l'étranger à leur patrie mère, l'Algérie veille à la prise en charge de leurs attentes et préoccupations à travers la création de nouvelles méthodes d'interaction pour que chaque citoyen puisse assumer sa responsabilité de citoyenneté avec l'appui de l'État algérien en étroite coordination avec les membres du Parlement qui représentent cette communauté, ainsi que les acteurs du mouvement associatif. Il s'agit d'encourager l'organisation du mouvement associatif par groupe, socio-professionnel, fédération et centre d'intérêt et par pays, sur la base d'un programme minimum commun. Il s'agit également de bâtir un véritable partenariat, loin de l'assistanat, pour répondre aux doléances des ressortissants algériens à l'étranger, et en même temps les mettre à l'abri de toute forme d'extrémisme, de discrimination et de stigmatisation. Je vous remercie. Merci, monsieur, pour ce témoignage de l'Algérie. Um, I would like now, if uh, the uh, hosts allow me, because we are slightly past our time, but I would like still five minutes, seven, maybe, Um, and to, to give the floor back to our panelists. And I will use a question that we received on the chat by Japan, and I would slightly tweak it so as to have each panelist giving their angle. And that is, what are the unique merits of migrants, whether they return or they're, uh, they're in, in country? What are the unique merits to Uh, communities and for communities and societies and I would like to ask each of you to give the answer considering the perspectives of the youth from Caroline of uh, women from uh, Amina and of diaspora from Peter so if I could start with uh, Amina here Thank you very much. Uh, the unique of uh, the diaspora on uh, what to do and where they are, they have, uh, what, what I find out is that uh, they have the attitude where they are able to adapt where they are to do what is supposed to be done, but they only need guidance. They need to be and shown what to do and given right skills to be given uh, maybe even startups on all that but they are very 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 good to adapt uh, in a any place that's why where they move they find that uh, that should be their home and see how they can better their lives and even maybe contribute back to their homes. So they are, they are very good examples and hard working people than others that I see. Thank you very much, Amina. Peter? Yes, indeed. Actually, uh, Danasba has got a lot of unique uh, points. 
characteristics. characteristics. The um, one of the very important ones we have witnessed these days um, is the cultural intelligence. The um, it doesn't have to be from a diaspora organization. Every migrant has got perhaps a person who has been living in the UK for many years can share experience. And I, we actually saw when I went to the supermarket, Chinese supermarket, I saw um, there are there are people who are living here for a long time trying to show them around and oh this sauce is nice and that that food is good to buy. So um, that kind of um, insight into the system. Uh, into settling in to the country is so so powerful. I don't think that uh, other about non-migrants would be able to do that because of the, the language and also the cultural understanding. Being able to speak in a way or, or uh, understand the angle where um, diaspora coming from is also something unique. And hence, for example, the uh, third party reporting center, we set up um, the virtual one. The reason why we set up for the East and Southeast Asian communities, because we know that our communities also understand the people we need, the communities in need. Instead, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, phys uh, physical third party reporting centers where, where uh, victims and witnesses report to are more towards faith, more towards uh, regional, geographical. So there is a unique way that we need to step in to help and uh, contribute more. But more importantly is to, uh, to know what strengths each type of diaspora have where we can harness them uh, in response to the different needs of the diaspora. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. And now, last but not least, the youth, Caroline. Thank you so much. Um, I think I'll be brief, but I think um, at the local level, one of the unique assets of young people on the move is their motivation, um, entrepreneurship and resilience, um, highly motivated um, because they have had to take an extra courageous step being a young person to establish themselves, but also because they're hopeful for a bright future ahead for themselves and to better in many senses, uh, their local and global communities. And then from an international standpoint, um, representation, young people do make up such a big percentage of global migrants, young people on the move that um, the voice and especially the voices of young people when they are given the opportunities to organize as is done in the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth um, kind of um, creates a very unique and very powerful platform to be able to uh, include young people in uh, innovations and, um, and recovery policies and programs that are long lasting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. And thank you, the three of you, Caroline, Peter, and Amina, for sharing uh, these uh, insights and uh, inspirational experiences. I've learned a lot, and I hope you have too, both in the room and our 120 people online. And I think you've helped to set the scene for the day because we're having panels on youth, on women, and on diaspora. So I think we're off to a good start of the day. Thank you very much again for sharing your experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. <laughs> Thank you all. And I would like to invite uh, Director of ICP of IM to come on the panel. Thank you. <laughs>